Year 42, she was pregnant. And when the Germans came at night, we had to be at home from 8 till 6 in the morning. And then everybody, said the Germans, the SS came with a list, could take everybody they wanted. And if they saw a pregnant woman, she was allowed to stay at home with her family till the birth of the baby. In 1940, everything was wonderful. My little sister was born at home. Mother was afraid to go to hospital. We had a Jewish uh, obstetrician, a Jewish, um, how do you say, um, midwife. Everything was okay. She, thank to God, lives today in this country. And she has 23 grandchildren from four children. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> I have only 23 together grandchildren and great-grandchildren. <laughs> okay, thank to God. But now in 42, everything went wrong. So we were still at home and, and all Jewish people around were almost taken. There were some other groups that were still in uh, Amsterdam, like women that could um, sew the uniform for the German army. They were needed, and in the meantime, everything was in meantime. They still were at home and some other groups. But now, this time, everything went wrong. First, my mother, the baby was dead by birth, a little boy. And then my mother died two days later at home. And now we had no protection. If at that night the Germans, the SS, would have come, we should have gone. And um, the people that had protection got an extra stamp. Now my father has to run around to try to get a stamp. And he got a stamp. He got one stamp for two different things. And I have to explain. So now my father has to try to get a stamp, and he got one stamp for two different things. Look, we arrived as German citizens in Holland. A passport is expiring one day. So no clerk from Berlin will send to Jewish people to Holland a new passport. I had an uncle in Switzerland. He was a law student. And he didn't want uh, with his parents to come to Holland after Crystal Night because he needed a German-speaking country to finish university. And so he could still, 38, go to Switzerland. And in 42 in Switzerland, you could buy in one of the South American consulates a passport. And he, he had no money, he had to lend money from Swiss people. He could buy for my grandparents a passport of Honduras, and for my father, my sister, and me, because mother was dead, a passport of Paraguay. Mm -hmm. I always asked, what is the capital city of Paraguay? <laughs> and they, maybe an SS man will ask me. I have to know something about my new country. Okay, so now, we had this passport, but we got something else, and we even thought it's more important. I said in my first sentence, my father was chief of the press, and he was one of the founders in Germany from the Hapoel HaMizrahi, the religi religious Zionistic um, party in the beginning of the 20th. And since he was chief of the press, he could write in the German press and in the Jewish about Palestine. He could speak in the radio, and that's what he did. And also my grandfather, he was still, he was a famous lawyer and a very good speaker. He was at the fifth congress with Theodor Herzl, and always would work to what people should come to this country. And now, there were negotiations between England and Germany, even there was a war going on in Geneva, Switzerland, to make so-named Palestine exchange lists. 
and suddenly everybody wanted to go to Palestine, but no, it was only for people that had children, parents or brothers and sisters already here. And we were uh, closed up because you had to go by England. England was in a war. And now what happened was the people that made this list knew my father very well. And even without doing something, also grandparents and also my father, my sister and me got a place at list number two as so named veterans because we had no family members. And maybe that also helped to, cha to, to save us because a year later there were suddenly 40 lists for exchange and at that night when the Jewish people in the camp already, we were already in the camp Westerbork, רק רגע, אני צריכה לשנות את זה אולי. אוי, הטלפון, טוב, לא חשוב. One moment, I have to explain. Look, okay, now we were, אפשר למחוק את זה? טוב. אוקיי, say just in English, I want to rephrase it. I want to? To change what I said before. Look, now we had this stamp. And we could stay for eight more months in Holland. At April, I had to stop to go to school, April 43. But you didn't know, uh, you never knew who is uh, sick, who was taken at night, or who was going into hiding. And so um, we had always, we needed a girl to take care of my little sister and my father, the household. When girl number three was taken, I had to stay at home. It went till 20 of June 43, and now it was our turn. Holland, the, the country was empty of Jewish people. Amsterdam, the ghetto was empty, and there were only people left like us with an extra stamp. And now they made a big call up, a razzia you called it in Germany, the 20 of June. The SS came, they closed the whole uh, south of Amsterdam and went from door to door and took every Jewish family. They came to our home, we had 20 minutes time, we could take 20 kilogram of luggage, we had to go down to the vents. The, we were brought to the railway station and there the cattle cars were waiting for us. We were brought at night to the camp Westerborg. That was uh, so named. No, Lama Tamit Hasali Mila. Mavar. Me Westerborg. Yeah, that was the transit. That was the main transit camp from Holland. 95% of Dutch Jewish people were sent from Westerborg. And um, in Westerbork, again, we could stay for a little more because of this stamp. Shaniach nisach shaf et ha... Shel achoti lo tzach liot basof, nachon? Ken, achi chashub, achi chashub, ulei tedabri berechef pashto? Zeo. Vehi yochola achar kach lach nis efo shi rotza. And when we arrived in Westerbork, First week we are there, my little sister and me were brought to an orphanage. Westerbork was not the worst of camps. And in this orphanage there was even quite enough food and there was very good taking care of the children. But my little sister after a week went to be very, very sick. And I call it a miracle what happened to her. She needed an operation with her ear because the pus would stream, and if she wouldn't get this operation, the pus would go to her brain, and she would have died of blood poisoning. Mm -hmm. My grandfather had a good friend that was a, um, a, a surgeon for years. The operation was okay, but the pus, the pus didn't stop streaming. We were eight months in Westerbork, so she was seven and a half months in the hospital, and when we were sent to Bergen-Belsen, she still had a big uh, bandage 
because there was no antibiotica. It was found already, but we didn't get. There was not enough even Advil or something else. And uh, she didn't want to eat. Father and me would sit there for hours after work. I worked with the children in the orphanage. And uh, it was really a miracle that she survived that. And uh, in February 44, we were sent to Bergen-Belsen. Grandfather died in November in Westerburg from a heart attack. So grandmother, father, sister, and me. My little sister was brought to me from the hospital directly to the train, cattle cars, the move on, um, for sure. And uh, we arrived in Bergen-Belsen. That was the so named um, exchange camp for people with North American, South American, and English passports, and people from the first and second exchange list to Palestine. I couldn't tell the whole story, but one night all the people from list 3 to 40 were sent to Auschwitz. At that night there were not enough other people in Westerbork. And we, by big luck, were not at list number 7, but at list number 2. So we were not sent. And now we arrive in this new camp, Bergen-Belsen, that is between Hamburg and Hanover in Germany. It should be an exchange camp, he told us. And there we should wait till we will be exchanged everybody to his country. Bergen-Belsen at the beginning was not so bad, but at the end I was told it was even worse than Auschwitz. They brought 